Today, many young people want socialism. Obviously, they don't know Millet. In the last episode, we talked about the animals in the wilderness, with neither guaranteed food supply nor health care. They tend to live much longer than their brothers in cages. Today, we're going to push this point a little further. Jean Francois Millet was born in 1814. In a peasant family, according to Turner's friend John Ruskin, great nations write their autobiographies in three manuscripts: the book of their deeds, the book of their words, and the book of their art. Not one of these books can be understood unless we read the two others. But of the three, the only quite trustworthy one is the last: the book of their art. Through Millet's life and work, especially his work, we see a quite trustworthy snapshot of the French country scene in the 19th century. Let's take a tour. The Bible, the Bible. Millet, who grew up with it from childhood, he did nothing but read that book. That's according to Van Gogh. Of course, Van Gogh was not entirely correct because Millet, at least, also read contemporary authors. In other words, although Millet worked in the field since childhood, he was far from ignorant. When Millet was 18, his drawings were taken to Cherbourg, the nearest town, some 20 kilometers away. His parents were soon told that Millet must study art. As a matter of God's will, his father sent him to Cherbourg, where he copied Poussin and Michelangelo, which formed. His skill base, together with the French farm culture, of course. Four years later, his teacher in Cherbourg and some others put up a stipend for him to study at the Ecole des Beaux Arts. The stipend lasted for two years. A year later, his first painting, a portrait, was accepted at the Salon of 1840. After that, he returned to Cherbourg to begin a career as a portrait painter. His dream, obviously, was not to conquer the world. But soon, Cherbourg, or even Le Havre, where he stayed for a short period, was probably a pond too small for him. He moved back to Paris. In 1849, Millet moved to Barbizon, a village some 60 kilometers away from Paris. On the edge of the Fontainebleau forest, where several other artists lived, they were collectively known as the Barbizon School, mostly for their landscape paintings. We're not going to get into that today. In Barbizon, Millet painted the farm scenes of the flat agricultural plain of the Chelly, and visited Paris to stay involved in the Paris art scene. There, he found. The right balance, and did not move again. Yes, we are in the age of photographs. First, let's make one point clear: Millet was known for his farm scenes, but let's not deduce therefrom that he was insensitive or insensuous. This is called reclining nude. It is as bourgeois as any painting. There is no argument that the reclining nude is a flesh painting. Of course, there are flesh paintings, and there are flesh paintings. Some are fine art, and some are for the titillating effect. With no clear lines between the two, let's compare it with this painting by his contemporary Gustave Coubert, *The Sleepers*. No further explanation is needed on which one is fine art, right? Look at the obtuse angles of the body against the curtains of the box bed. The composition was quite modern, okay, at least quite unique. 
Her nude body, in all kinds of fabrics and nothing else, made the scene snug and cozy. Millet did not like this painting and pretty much ended there. Coubert went further and painted things like the origin of the world. Since it is basically eroticism, I'm not going to show it here. If you're curious, just Google porn. You'll get a lot of that. On the other end of the spectrum, down the history, we see many people when seeing nudity of any kind in any circumstance, they cry foul. I really think that these people have a disorder in their body's sexual hormone operations. Somehow, nudity means to them improper sex and immoral or unethical activities. Is it because that their minds are dirty? Either deviation from nature was a modern city bourgeois disorder that Millet hated, like disease. To Millet, these people seriously needed some physical labor, preferably in the form of farm labor. Now Millet was in Barbizon, far enough from the Paris bourgeois scenes. Let's see what was his calling. This one is called going to work. Generally speaking, if an artist wants to express strong emotions, bright colors and dramatic scenes are usually the choice. Look at the color. In Van Gogh's word, Millet's paintings seem painted with the earth they sow. Look at the facial emotions of these two peasants going to work. This is a woman baking bread. This is called the potato harvest. Shepherdess seated on a rock. This one is called the Gleaners. In the village of Barbizon, Millet lived with many other artists developing the Barbizon school. In the village where he was born and grew up, he was taught Latin and read modern authors. He was sent away to study art when showing his artistic potential. One might say that these villages are highly cultured places. So we should not take the lack of emotion on their faces as being dumb. Look at these two working in synchrony. Do you see the poetry in it? Nothing stand out in this picture. The brightest points are actually in the back, directly violating atmospheric perspective. This one is called bringing home the calf born in the fields. Tolstoy liked Millet's paintings because they both worshipped peasants. Some say that Millet's paintings were some kind of complaint made on behalf of the working people. In fact, his painting style was being used by the Leninist propagandists as part of the communist aesthetics. But that should not be used to define Millet because the peasants under the communists' brushes are always emotional. Let's discuss this a little further while looking at this painting. True Marxists are unhappy agitators who do not accept their conditions and do not want to work their way to their utopia. They believe in the so-called remaining value, which according to the Marxist economic theory is the capitalist class getting undeserved excess rewards over the labor class. If that's true, 
those who have the choice of working for other people and starting their own businesses would choose the latter. As long as the remaining value exists, more people will open their own businesses until supply and demand through competition eliminates the remaining value. Since we see no such movement, the so-called remaining value does not exist. In other words, capitalists are paid better because of their experience, especially in risk-taking and the risk that they take. Only 50% of new companies survive in five years. In the meantime, the successful risk-takers develop technologies that change the world. The Marxists, of course, could not be bothered with the inconvenient details. They want to resolve the fictional income disparity through class struggle, or, to be more explicit, through the government, run by Marxists themselves with the force of law, robbing the capitalists to pay the laborers. Of course, the paycheck, retirement plan, and health care for the bureaucrats are always many folds better than the laborers they serve. The Marxist takeover depends on whether their agitations could convince enough people to join their ranks against the capitalists. The recent agitation is still the income disparity. But if you study the situation, the income disparity is mostly caused by the difference of experience, shown as age in statistics. It simply means that higher paying jobs require more experience, which the young people lack. Data support that understanding, as those in the lowest quintile today typically move up in a few years. In order to help the young people moving up faster, the educational system could give them more working experience. But of course, the Marxist schools cannot be bothered with that. They want to keep their instruction homework examination method, so they could do what they're best at, in other words, socialist indoctrination. The ignorance of the public is what the Marxists rely on to get their way. For more than 30 years since I first came to America, all educational reforms failed because schools are for and run by teachers, not the students, politically speaking. Just like the welfare system are there for the government bureaucrats, not the poor welfare recipients. If you have actually listened to my blah 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 so far, you know what kind of a big city nonsense and frustration that Millet wanted to avoid. This is really relevant to Millet. The year before he moved to bac he experienced the Paris Commune. This one is called Shepherd Tending His Flock. As we have said, True farmers could not be Marxists, because Marxists resent working. If you want to take a look at the Marxist elite, you can go to Washington, D.C. and observe people entering or exiting those cold, monumental government buildings before and after working hours. If you're far away from Washington, any European capitals would do even better. Just ask this question. Do they show the same kind of inner peace on their faces? Millet saw through all that and stayed away from those fancy-schmancy political ideologies or big city lives in general. When he said that he was not associated with any socialist, we can trust that he was telling the truth. Unlike the city rats who are too often compelled to speak things other than their true minds, Millet had no such need. He, in Aesop's lingo, was a country mouse. This one is called Potato Planters. Millet said, The human side of art is what touches me most. We can feel the explosive power hidden in the subdued colors and emotionless figures. This one is called Winter, the Faggot Carrier. To better understand Millet, let me put up a couple of paintings by Coubet. This one is called The Wheat Sifter. Look at the emotions on people's faces.
This one is called Stone Breakers. Clearly, Courbet's figures express more emotions than Millet, but somehow they appear less powerful. To Millet, power is working calmly and consistently, and in the belief that is a way to improve their lives. Besides, of course, he is probably simply painting what he saw. From the pure standpoint of modern art techniques, Millet may not have accomplished as much as the others that we have covered. Still, I feel that I must cover him because of the raw power in his seemingly subdued paintings. That goes well with what he said. It seems absurd to me that people want to seem other than they are. His plain talking, like his paintings, seems not much at the first glance, but if you care to look a little deeper, it is infinitely profound. We living in modernity all know how hard it is to be rid of the vanities in us and be real. Millet showed us the raw power needed to accomplish that. Painters like Millet, Chazin, or Van Gogh were not appreciated for long stretches of their careers, either until their old age or after death. Millet survived Barbizon with a deal with Alfred Sincere of exchanging painting material for his finished paintings, plus what he could sell himself. That was hardly a fair deal. Chazin stuck it out because of his inheritance. Van Gogh was supported by his brother Theo. The young believers of the socialist utopia of the government-enforced fair society might argue that lives of these artists could be improved with some kind of fixed minimum wage. Since the wage has to apply to everyone, it has to be in the form of universal minimum wage. Otherwise, the government judges will throw them out, just like the salon judges, by claiming that what they produced was not art. The guaranteed subsistence would take out their potential private customers, and the hunt. They would have to sell their paintings to the government, following the government's instructions. Of course, you know how much Millet would hate that. He moved out of Paris to Barbizon just to be away from any of this. He was not nearly so naive as those who took him as a socialist. I'm sure there is a lesson somewhere here. I'll see you next time.